Hello everyone, this is Morgan again and I'm here for another little video about continual playing, the wonders of continual playing. So today I have two exciting things for you. I cooked up a few exercises, which I think will be kind of fun, you know, sort of exploring the uh, strong weak thing that we've, uh, that you always run into when you do anything with Baroque music. And then also we're going to finish up with a little Vivaldi at the end. We're going to explore maybe just the first cello sonata, the first movement. We're going to look at that a little bit, talk about some fun little bits and bobbles in that. So. I'm sure if you have ever taken a class on Baroque music, something that comes up is strong and weak. I have attempted, attempted, attempted to notate this. So you notice you have the box that's strong, you have the open box that is weak, okay? It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. And then I really went ham with the dynamics and you see, look at all these little, little things here. You've got all these dashes, you've got all these dots, you've got all these things, okay, commas, wow. Look at that, even put my name in there. Professional. Okay, so we're gonna play through this first and then we're gonna move on to our Vivaldi. Move on to our Vivaldi. So, if you'll notice, this is an exercise from Corette. I'm just going to point this out really quickly and then I'm gonna play it. So I'm gonna play it once with the music up here so that you guys can kind of see it. And then I'm gonna play it without the music. Hopefully by then, you will have downloaded it and we'll look, look at it on your own device. Okay, so you'll notice we start with a nice little piano here and we go up, 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 up to the second measure where it's a forte and then we go down. Now I would like you to notice what I did right here. This is not a typo. Yes, there are three notes that are not strong and you'll hear that in a second, okay? So let's just play this and let's see how it sounds. So we have... Okay, so kind of a quick exercise. All right, so we start here and we go, comma, So for the sake of this exercise, this one's a little bit, I wrote it to be a little bit kind of, you know, car sicky. We're gonna go, right? And so what we're looking for though is strong, weak, strong, weak, okay? And that comes from our bow hand. Now you can do this with a modern bow. Obviously it's a lot easier to use a Baroque bow and this kind of setup to play this kind of music, but I just would like to point out, it's totally possible with modern bow, you just gotta think about it a little bit differently, right? So let's think about the shapes that we want and how to achieve them. So we want, all right? So we have, notice how that one is, right? And so we can do that a few different ways, actually. We can either do this, clipped, we can do it a little longer, Right, but you notice how it goes one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. And I notated that as strong, weak, weak, weak. Ooh, you can hear my cat in the background. Ooh, he's loud today. All right, so we have. So getting into even more of a macro analysis here, you'll notice with my fingers, what I'm doing is I'm going. So we have a long, short. But you'll notice how I'm not going, right? You wanna be careful about your up bows when you're playing this kind of music. The up bow is the thing you're gonna kick, right? You always wanna kick that up bow, resist that urge. What we want is, notice how it just, just, ooh, yeah. So we go. Mmm, delicious. Now, keep in mind, this, of course, is a guideline, um, what I've written here. You know, you can choose to do this a number of different ways if you so desire, but I think that this is a pretty good way to train yourself how to do it. So again, what we're looking for here is we're looking for strong, weak, strong, weak, long, and weak, weak, and then... Notice how it's 
I want to get that nice up bow there. It's like all resonance because we already played a G, right? We already have a... So I think that that's always a good thing to remember is that if you have already played a note, then, and there's a note directly after it, everyone's gonna remember the note. Everyone's gonna remember that G is important here. And you're gonna play the note, and then you're gonna let the bottom one just nicely come in afterwards. Okay, great. So, you'll notice there's another one that's in three at the, uh, the next exercise. I'm gonna do it the same way. I'm gonna play this for you, and then we're gonna talk about it. So, we have. So you notice I jammed myself in the middle of that, all right? So again, I'm gonna talk about why I jammed myself because I always think about it a different way, but I try to notate it something that was a little bit more like common rather than kind of exploratory, right? You always wanna go with common, right? No, no, you don't wanna always go with common. Okay, anyways, so we go. little hemiolo there at the end which is always exciting so what we want with this one is one two three one two three we want it to go up we do not want it to be one two three one two three right that's not the vibe if this was something more of like a kind of a more robust piece something that was you know really big and full right we'd want <laughs> totally do it that way but I'm recommending we do it the sort of gallant and a little bit more stylish version which is going to be one two three one two three one, one two, three. right and so let's zoom in a little bit on that what we have is we have a scoop and these two notice how I'm just letting the bow do it I'm not going right or it's just Right? We have uh, and That's important. It goes. Because we have a one and a two. We have a. And now, this is where we get into where I jammed myself. You can do this two ways. I wrote it the more common way, I think, the, just what, what you'd expect to see as a modern musician today, which would be down. Now, if you wanted to do this super fancy, you do it a, right, we can throw in another one of those. Now, somebody gave me some very good advice about hemiolas that you want to leave the second one you want to let that one kind of be chill and the first one and the last one to be really where you're aiming right so you don't want to go right you want something more like this you want something more like right you notice that subtle little difference there that just very subtle little difference sort of makes it all of a sudden seem like it is in three or a big three in that moment rather than one and two and three and it's one and two and three and one which is kind of what the hemiola is so anyways this one has some more bowings this one has much more commas many more commas i should say much more commas and the way that you're going to kind of approach that if we start from the beginning again we have <laughs> You notice how I'm really giving it a lift. Ah, I kind of jumped the third one there. You see how that really changes the feel, right? So you don't want to maybe jump the third one. Or maybe you do. It's kind of up to you. I've left this a little bit ambiguous in that respect. Okay, so those are some exercises. And then we're going to play a little thing by Robert Crome. Um, I don't know if you've read his uh, manuscript. It's on IMSLP. I'll put a link in the description. But, you know, it's kind of hilarious. I would really disregard, like, most of his advice in the actual manual part. But in the back of the book, there's all these really good uh, kind of simple exercises. They're just sort of fun to rip through, right? And so I kind of, I took one of them that seemed a little bit fun. And we're going to play it. 
I'm gonna play it with the music up and then I'm gonna play it again and then we'll talk about it, okay? So this one's a little bit more classical, right? But we're still gonna stick with our Baroque setup here because I don't wanna change bows. All right, so we have. So we have immediately presented with a few challenges here. We've got some weird grace notes. We've got some weird trills, which we're going to talk about in a second. And also, we just have kind of this, it needs to have that lilting dance-like, very classy, very like, oh yes, keep your back straight kind of dancing stuff, right? So we have the beginning here. It's always one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. I chose this one because it's kind of fun, you know. I, I just I just think it's kind of fun. It's a fun little piece. So you'll notice we have much more dramatic movement in this one. We already, right out of the gate, we're gonna have to be thinking about our bow and we want a long. Right? I kind of cracked it there a little bit. What we want is a right, and so I will say this in um I'm I'm sort of treating this exercise how I would expect somebody to look at it and kind of how I recommend an intro to the Baroque style, which is you really, you wanna push your technique as far as you can while you're practicing, all the time. You know, uh, I think that in today's world, it's so easy to fall into like, well, I'm doing everything well, and I'm fine, and I don't need to learn anything else, I've got it, right? And so I think that there's always something to learn about technique. And so when you're doing something like this, you really wanna push that boundary as far as you can, because that's the whole point of this. It's musical exercise, right? And the whole thing is, Connecting your technique to like your intentions and then actually producing something that is not only musical but reads as musical to the audience. And so a good way to do that is to just in the practice room, of course, in the practice room, <laughs> not in real life, in the practice room, um, just like take it too far, crack the note, you know, push the bow too far down towards the bridge, you know, hit the, try and do something weird with your bow angles, right? Because if you don't do it in the practice room, then when are you ever going to take those risks with your playing, you know, it's always important to just challenge yourself like that. Kind of keeps it a little fresh, you know? At least that's what I say to myself. I, you know, try and convince myself, right? I'm just trying to keep it fresh. I'm not messing up, I'm keeping it fresh, right? So anyways, we have from here, we're gonna go. You notice how we end? We push a little bit closer to the bridge. We use a little bit of a scoop thing there. We get that. And when I say scoop, what I mean is we're gonna go. You notice how it's like a, it's like a sort of a compression and a slowdown and then a speed up out. So we go, uh, right? So we go. Uh, now you'll notice it's. Now I would think with those two, it's not. Right, and so, for example, if we were gonna play this a little bit more of a martial feel to it, a little bit more of a marching kind of feel, if somebody asked you to play something similar to this in a martial feel, what we would do is we would clip everything, and so instead of one, two, three, we have one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So it's very similar, but it's like you just take the beginning of it and you kind of throw it up, and then you don't, you don't like gracefully let it come back down. So what that sounds like is, you 
notice how it's like almost the same architecture, just you notice how I'm throwing everything up and then letting it come back down, right? I'm not going. Right? That's somebody asking you like, excuse me, sir, can I have three more shrimp puffs, please? As opposed to, you know, right? Like sit down and give me 20 push-ups kind of situation. All right. So we're not going for push-ups, but we're going for a shrimp puffs. All right. Shrimp puffs over push-ups. All right. So going from the second part here, we have a, we have a one, two, three, and four. Notice how it's now it's two bar phrases. So we go. All right. So let's talk about these kind of weird trills here over at the end. So you'll notice I'm always starting from the top note and going down. That is something that will come up a lot. Uh, some people will say that is like the Baroque trill. Um, I don't really know what to say about that. I mean, I guess it is. Um, it is more chromatic to do it that way sometimes and sometimes it's not. I mean, if you think about the trill as kind of like an ornament, Right? If you think about standardizing an ornament, it doesn't really make sense because, I mean, it's supposed to be something special and it's supposed to fit the case, right? But of course we need to standardize it so that we can articulate it to other people. So we have... If you wanted to do that way, we have sort of a clipped version. We have a... That just sounds wrong, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like what he's trying to do with these trills is going uh, notice how it's just a scale going down and so by landing on the bottom note and trilling up we'll, we're, we are establishing that the bottom note is more important and by landing on the top note and trilling down we are establishing that the top note is important and it is pushing us to somewhere else which is the whole point of an ornament so we have <laughs> And a great way to practice these, and a great way to actually practice trills in general, is to go three times and then end it. So we have. Right? Right? And then start there. So that'll give you a good basis for, like, not, you know, laser trilling, right? Which is very common. It's a very hard habit to break. So you don't want to laser trill these. We want to go. Uh, and notice now a little bit of bow technique. We're going to lean into that first note. We're going to go. Uh, Nos. And the way that I'm doing that is, of course, I am compacting a little bit here, right? And then popping right out of there. So we go. Uh, Right, and don't be afraid, everyone. Don't be afraid of using this section of your cello. It is actually, I know that everyone here probably has teachers and such that tell them, you know, never play up here. And I think it's a good idea to learn how to play closer to the bridge. And so that sentiment, I agree with. However, you can achieve some really fun and interesting colors in this section of our cello. It just has to be done properly, and you have to understand what you're trying to do when you go up there. So when you go above a fingerboard like that and when you kind of take it out there, what you're doing is you're trying to minimize the amount of core in your sound. And that can be good and that can be bad. So for example, if you're trying to play something very loud and you're keeping it up here over, you know, above the fingerboard here and you're like Notice how it just it just kind of sounds like a mess, right? It just sounds like washy and a mess. And you'd want to be more of a Ooh, you wouldn't want that. You want And of course you'd want to play the right notes. You know, of course you'd want to play the right notes. But you'll notice how when I want to do that, it sounds just much more clearer down here. It sounds like what it should, right? And up here it just kind of sounded like a mess. However, if I tried to play something really quiet down here kind of sounds bad too, but that up here all of a sudden, wow, that's such a nice silky texture, a nice silky color that you've got up there, right? So 
I'm just gonna say you need to remember that if you're gonna use any of these effects know the reason why you're using them and then sit in the practice room and actually try and execute it you know don't just let it you know be like oh well I'm trying to be soft so I need to go here try it a few times try try a couple things for example if we start there from the uh, the <laughs> Right? Let's just say we want to go loud. Uh, right? Finish it off in a nice chord or something like that, right? So maybe that's what you want. I would always advise try out some different dynamics. You know, sit here and, and mark in a couple of things. Try a couple of things with this. See how it works. You know, I, it's kind of fun. And I finished this off with something that you know I, you can really use for this purpose. So this is a ground by Simpson. You know, you're just gonna repeat this forever. And the, what I would advise when you're practicing this is to try it a whole bunch of different ways. So I think I can skip right to over here. This is mostly gonna deal with the bow. So we're gonna go. It's fairly simple. The reason why I chose something fairly simple to do with this is because what we want to do is practice now. So we're going to go short. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's try something more bombastic. Let's try something a little bit more refined and a bit more, hmm, yes, hmm, yes. All right, so we have. Hmm, and you see where I'm going with this. You see you're trying a bunch of different strokes and ideas, right? And so that, I think, is enough to probably keep you busy for a while. Just experiment, you know, try some things. Of course, what I have written is a great recommendation. It comes from experience, it comes from some study, and it also comes from just, you know, it just, I, I, I think that this is kind of the way to do it, right? But now, I am not the supreme authority of Baroque cello, and if you like it a different way, you are more than welcome to change what I have written and do it a different way. I'm not going to break out of your computer screen and tell you no, you know, as is tradition. Um, anyways, let's move on to a little Vivaldi. Okay, we're gonna move on to a little of Vivaldi because I think that we can do a few things with this that I've talked about and some people have asked me. So now, when you're playing a sonata, these are from the Vivaldi cello sonatas. When you're playing a sonata, um, you know, your inclination is, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna realize, I'm gonna get into here, I'm gonna like, you know, I'm gonna go on these notes here and you see how they have the sixes and the sevens and the this is and the that's and whatever and I'm I'm so good I'm so good at the cello that I'm gonna realize this and I'm gonna play all of these chords now I have a few feelings about this first feeling is um you you, you need to keep the hierarchy right there's a bass line and there's a solo line now a harpsichord when they're playing, they not only are voice leading and playing in a way that is intentionally staying out of your way, but it's also a different instrument. It sounds different. It's going to be in a different register, right? It, you, you don't pick up the harpsichord as one individual line. You pick up the harpsichord in your ear as like an amalgamation of pitches, right? And so no matter what they do, I mean, they're going to sound like they're accompanying or they're not, right? And in our case, with the cello, people's ears more naturally hear us as like something that they want, they like their ears drawn to what we're doing, right? And so that is great and awesome, but that's also dangerous because we are not the soloist, we are the accompaniment. And putting too much chordal energy into a piece or making it too busy on the bottom or doing something, you know, you're, you're, you're strutting your stuff and you're showing how great your thirds and sixths and fifths are, and you've, you've thrown in all this, all this chordal energy and all this stuff in practice and practice, but at the end of the day, it sounds weird because like you're sounding like you're playing a little concerto underneath the solo line, when in reality, everybody just wants to hear the solo line. They don't want to hear you playing harmony. I don't think I've ever, 
I mean, there's there's probably some people that do, but like you don't go to a concert to hear like harmony. You go to a concert to like hear some cool melodies and hear some cool stuff, right? Please don't like, please don't kill me for saying that. All right, we're in tune. So I'm gonna kind of play this just a little bit of it. And uh, we're gonna kind of like hear how this sounds. I'm just gonna play the first part, okay? So we have... too big there at the end I really wanted to make it nice and juicy so let's talk about this so we have over here we want to start it off with a nice gentle that was completely straight by the way no ornamentation so we have notice how I'm going out and I'm saying it and you'll notice how my tone is strong and yet the ends of it I'm making sure to use a little bit more bow and a little bit more ring, right? Okay, and making sure that it's not... So what that does is it imposes my version of the intonation onto the performance versus this. Maybe the harpsichord you're playing with is a little stinky, you know? Maybe it's a little, it's a little spicy. Or maybe the soloist wants to play this B flat that... They want to play a little higher, a little low. And what that does is it allows them the space to kind of be creative. So we have uh, And then we're going to lift this next part up. So now if you listen to the melody line above this, right? If we listen to the melody line, it is... Right? And so we have the melody. Now, let's do some realizing. Let's figure out what we can do here. So I'm a really big fan of arpeggios when it comes to arpe our uh, realizing. So we have... Uh, I think you should keep that. I think that that's important to keep that because we already have... It's busy. We go... If we do anything in there, we're going to ruin the integrity of literally the opening phrase. We do not want to impose anything in there. It's very clear that Vivaldi wanted it to sound like dee 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 bum ba da dum. And then we go. Now, if you wanted to add some energy in here. something like that uh, I mean I just don't I really don't actually think though that that's valid I mean I, I just it sounds a little busy to me so I mean obviously for me I wouldn't do that however if you wanted to do something like that that would probably be your chance you would want to tack it onto the end here you wouldn't want to do anything else right because it's the opening phrase you want to let the soloist establish that this is the theme, right? And then we have these weird suspensions. Now, I actually thought about this. And what I was thinking was, you could kind of create the illusion of the, the two suspension there. We get the... Raised four, we have... Uh, and then I was thinking you could do... try and get back to that B flat we get the because we have that six five right here right but I mean the six five is whatever but we want to establish that we are actually playing that chord I think personally because you know you the, the 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 solo line up at the top up here it's kind of already doing stuff right and then you notice how they've got all those accidentals in there so 
I'm not a theory buff. Um, I'm not really going to be able to tell you exactly what is going on, but all I know is that if I see accidentals, I'm going to assume that they're covering a lot of the chromatics already and that I don't need to. So I'm going to go... And then I probably would go... And then we go... Get that nice two there, right? So I'm going to play that in context to just show you kind of what's happening because we have and one and one and one. So we don't want to ruin kind of the, the rhythmic integrity of this by adding in a whole bunch of like chords or something like that. Because when you add in a chord, it's right. I mean, that's so much more of an arrival already just listening to it. You're like, whoa. Right? And you don't want that because that's not what this section is telling you. It's uh, right? It's this mm, lilting passage on the top there. So, it, in context, that would be starting from the beginning, we have. So, you know, I mean, that's one way of doing it, but now I'm just gonna play it the other way. And I'm gonna let you guys sort of fill in the gap with the suspension yourself. And I'm just gonna show you that you maybe don't have to do that. You don't have to work like that. We have. see one is different one is different it's nice to have both in your tool belt but of course understand that you know the more notes that you put in the more notes that you put in so you just have to kind of be careful with that so we are we're gonna keep going from that little section there the fun little tag there at the end if you want. So what I'm going to do here is we have uh, taking extra care on that open A string to make it fold into the texture. Like what I talked about with gut strings is that you can really play these open strings in a way that folds them really nicely into the texture. So we have the Notice how these were all nice and light, and then we go because what we're doing is we are going to be pushing this thing all the way to here, right? We are going all the way from here to here, and so that means that these guys should probably have a little more juice to them, okay? So, what that sounds like is I'm using my patented trick here. We're going. Now you'll notice the first time that I play this, I took that too far. And I like made my elbow do something weird, right? I like really did. I kind of came out completely on it. So the trick with getting that C string, you know, because you're already kind of bottomed out with your with your elbow here. You're going. Yeah. Right? And so what I would recommend is try and keep this in your fingers as much as possible and get like, so you don't want, or you want, so you want kind of the front of it. 
You want the nice ring? The... All right. Now, if you really were fancy, if you really want to do some fancy stuff here, we have the... Right? Or a... Uh, uh, there we go, that's fun. drove it into the wrong key area there you see what I mean but it's always fun to try stuff like that because then you don't know I probably would just add that I probably just to okay awesome so let's keep moving on with this moving on with this just a little bit because I think that the second part here is just so much juicier all right we have we have a... So you'll notice this is a great time to actually throw in a little bit of realization here to kind of keep the energy moving. So in my ear, the... that sounds a little lame to me, right? And so if you're going to kind of make that a little bit more fancy, if we're going to kind of make this a fancier thing, what we'd probably want is a... Mmm, that's one way, but you notice how I went... That sounds kind of lame. Uh... Because let's look, we have in here... We have our sharp or a slash five, right? And up in the top, in the tenor clef there, we had, do have a C natural. Mm -hmm. So we probably don't actually want to get in the way there. We probably just want to go. And then this next chord right here, it's a six chord, right? And so with that one, uh, we can do something like that you'll notice i use kind of more of an aggressive ramp up here and i use adding in more notes to really hammer in the fact that we are going somewhere with that right so let's just maybe uh try a couple different things uh... F with a sharp third five six so we have we could do something like that uh, well, that's kind of aggressive but I mean I kind of like the scalar motion the I think that Whatever it is up there on the top. I think that it's kind of ambiguous, so you can get away with, you know, kind of throwing in some extra notes. You notice how I like to keep the, the end of that. I like to keep it more of just a womp, 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 right? And you could do something else with it, but I think, you know, it's just not smart to pack in the end of a cadence there. You know, it's just, just let the cadence be. Just, just guys, just let the cadence be. And then we keep going. 
and I choose not to go because I just it's too busy. It's a and you notice in that part uh, in the music up here, the top line is doing a lot. Right, the top line is just doing a whole bunch already, so no need to pack it in there. We can leave that there. The rhythm sounds good to me. Uh... Now that's a good chance for you to add a little fill. Uh... That sounds kind of fancy, but I don't know if that's the right chords, but we have... So that, that's actually what is written, of course. We have that nice, uh, sharp... Uh, yes, right, with that four... Right, we have a... Essentially, right? So we can go... nice little link there because you'll notice there's a nice space right here that we can totally fill in this is your chance this is your moment this is the Carnegie Hall moment all right you're gonna get in here and it's just gonna be like the, the air clears and oh yes and you're gonna link in with that right and I actually would actually I would recommend padding something like that because what that does is it allows it fills in the space just a bit and it lets the soloist kind of, you know, link into something versus just playing on silence, right? And they hear you and then, then there's momentum that pushes them into that recap and they will be very happy about that. As long as you don't do something with 16 notes, all right? So we have, uh, I would say to probably keep this part. keep this part a little more straight obviously you might have a inclination to do something with this section right there um, if you were to do something like that the um, where is that so you could go uh, I think that that probably would be smarter to go down to a low A there instead of playing the high third. You could do a little arpeggiation there. I think that going lower though is probably smarter than because the, the the cello part, the first cello part is kind of high, and you don't want to get in their in their bits, right? You don't want to get in their biz. You want to let them be the soloist, and so you'll notice. Just to play this out one more time, we have the... Uh... So this is a great time to talk about our bow hand here. We have... Uh... caution I would strongly caution against messing with these last two measures we have the all that stuff because we have the and the the top line right and that's that's like again just like with the beginning you don't really want to mess with the end here because you want to let it end and this lets the audience know the piece is ending, just like how this video is ending. So if you've made it all this way, thank you very much for watching. Congratulations. All right. Um, you'll notice a lot of the techniques that I use, especially with Continuo, revolve around how aggressive my tone is and thinking always about, you know, 
How can I create as much energy and as much space as possible and yet maintain that I'm the accompaniment? I'm there to satisfy a specific need and no more than that, right? I think that that is really important and that's something that I have to remind myself a lot of and it's something I work really hard at is because it's so easy to get up there and feel like, well, I've worked so hard, I'm important. And you are important, but it is important that you play the bass line. And it is not important that you play the solo, right? It's important that the soloist plays the solo. And that is an interesting thing to say and also kind of a hard thing to do. So anyways, thank you again. Thank you for practicing. And thank you for looking at this wonderful video. I will see you next time.